Um, so good morning, uh, afternoon, everyone. Again, please mute your lines, as you heard Crystal just say. And also, please do not um, put us on hold if you have to step away. Sometimes there's music that will play in the background, and unfortunately, we do not have the ability to um, mute that out. Um, so for today's uh, learning session, uh, we will be talking about data today. And as usual, we'd like to give to um, our colleagues at HRSA through the Maternal and Child Health Bureau, um, through which the EIC is supported. Um, this sits under the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And as always is the case, the information, content, and conclusions that are presented here should not be construed as the official position or policy or endorsement of HRSA or any of the uh, U.S. government. So at this point, we're trying to um, make a slight change in terms of attendance and participation. And so for those of you uh, who are on the call today, if you're able to, um, you'll see in um, the chat box there is a poll. And we're using this now to be able to monitor participation. So if possible, during the course of this call, if you can, please go ahead and enter um, the name of your hospital so that uh, we know who was on the call today. Um, of course, we have our 16 teams, the Last Frontier Kids, the Lifesavers, Mocan Rocks, the Longhorn Kids, the North Texas Division of HCA, Fight or Flight Response Team, New England EMSC, Eight is Enough, Red Tea for Kids, Pit Crew, Remock Minions, uh, the Wisconsin Whisper, the Wrangler for Kids, the Oregon Pediatric uh, Preparedness Program, East Texas uh, Children's Hospital, and the Pediatric Peaches. So welcome uh, all of you and thanks for joining us today. And again, um, just enter your hospital's name so that we can uh, try to make sure we get that uh, recorded. Um, so for today, uh, this is just an outline of where we will be um, going. So we're going to spend a few minutes just introducing you all to our colleagues at the National EMS for Children Data Analysis Resource Center. Um, we will also be talking a little bit about where we are with data use agreements uh, so that you all can have an update on that. We'll be talking a little bit about the data entry system. Uh, we'll talk about data sampling and then we'll turn it back to Crystal to finish up with some housekeeping and our plans for the November learning session. So we are so grateful for the help and support of these, uh, this wonderful team from NEDARC here. Um, we're so grateful to have Mike Ely on the call with us today. He is the director for uh, NEDARC, has been with the program for over a decade and uh, brings a wealth of knowledge and experience uh, related to data analysis and uh, 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 display. Lenora Olson is the principal investigator for the National EMSC Data Analysis Resource Center. And Hillary Hughes is a co-investigator and pediatric emergency medicine physician. Patty Schmuel uh, is a data manager and we uh, think of her as really a data wizard. She was behind the National Pediatric Readiness Assessment Portal, um, crafted um, the gap analyses that existed for that. Um, and brings a wealth of experience to the table. Eddie Zamora is a business data analyst and is, has been with NEDARC uh, and is going to be and continues to help support you uh, with the data use agreements as we move forward. And finally, John Brummett is the man behind the scenes who has been building from the ground up uh, the data entry system and is joining us today and has just done uh, an incredible job of doing that. So. Um, these are all the folks uh, from NEDARC, uh, housed in Salt Lake City, Utah, who will be uh, talking with you today about the data entry system. So at this point, uh, what I'd like to do is turn it first over to Eddie Zamora, who's going to be talking about the data use agreements and providing an update for that. Hi, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. Um, do I have control, Crystal, or do you have control? 
I have control. Just let me know when you want to switch, and I'll advance the slides for you. Okay, great. Um, so this first slide um, really has the DUA, DUA flow chart we shared with you a couple months ago. I wanted to just quickly review it to make sure we're on the same page with the process, especially as new sites have come on. So uh, the University of Utah has designed the template for the data use agreement. Um, at this point, all sites have been emailed that template. Um, most sites have decided whether they're going to use our DUA or whether they're going to use their own DUA or, in some cases, their business associates agreement. Um, in most instances, the site uses our DUA and then chooses to use our DUA with some revisions, just uh, some minor language changes. Um, once those are uh, ex once we know what approach the site's going to use, we kind of move forward and for the next slide. Sorry, Crystal. And then we get to this point where we are reviewing kind of red line edits. So um, this could be a conversation on some of the language differences, um, just minor wording, uh, and it's kind of a, this, this kind of point of negotiation where the two entities come to an agreement. And once we're both all, we're all in agreement, we get to that last phase, which is kind of that signature phase, um, which is where uh, we, we get our two signatories to sign, the site gets their signatory to sign, and we, send, and we finally send over those finalized copies via electronic, well, via email of the fully executed uh, DUAs. Um, on our end, we'll kind of file those. So, I just wanted to go over that so that we were kind of aware of that workflow. I also have a, a JPEG version, and it's also on the, on the DUA website, on the DUA uh, box. So for the next slide, um, as we've been working through these uh, DUA templates, um, I've been noticing just a couple issues. So if you can go to the next slide. Um, on page one, uh, so that, that, that comes with a little bit, but on recital B of the DUA template on page one, you'll notice that it says covered entity through its workforce member. So one common um, kind of like issue that comes up is that portion being left blank. So if you are submitting a DUA, um, just ensure that like you enter the individual who will be working on the quality improvement efforts name. So, if, so you could say through its workforce member, Mike, Mike Ely is engaged in activities involving quality improvement. Um, I'll usually review those, but that kind of that sometimes slows down the the process because I need to get permission for me to enter that name or just ask you to enter it yourself. Um, next slide, please. Another uh, common uh, kind of like a common issue that comes up. Um, those two the section. Next slide, please. The section of their unique codes or identifiers and the closure of limited data sets, those can be left blank. Um, they're more standard, they're more like formatting uh, errors. And I, you know, since a lot of you have that template in place, I haven't made a change to it, but um, it does come up from time to time um, whether that's an issue. But yeah, those are just minor issues. Now I'm going to move over to the next slide to just give some kind of a broad update of where we're at. So at the moment, um, this is a snapshot of where all of our sites are in terms of DUAs. So there's a little more than about almost 140 sites. About can you go to the next slide? About 27%, about a quarter, have a fully executed DUA. Um, that means that they received an email from NEDARC saying you're good to go. Here's a copy of your DUA for you to file. About 5% um, are kind of in the signature phase. So we've negotiated, we've addressed any issues or concerns, and now we're kind of moving forward um, with, with, with getting those signatures. That the, the bars in yellow, so that's 5.9% and that 27.7%, we, we, we would call those a negotiation. Uh, that 5.9% is a smaller portion of sites, just a few where um, the site is using their own template in most cases, 
and we're just uh, trying to, you know, get the language to match with what we need. Um, and that 27% represents uh, the three network um, system, or the, the three health networks that are currently getting their DUAs kind of uh, also negotiated. So I think once we, if, if, you, if you add that up, you know, we will have about a little more than 60% of our DUAs are being touched. Either they're fully executed or they're in our negotiations. Now, for that final 34% that you see in the far right, if you can go to the next slide, um, about half of those, I would say um, there's been some communication. So I'm aware that they're working on it. And then I would say another half, I probably, I'm probably i not too aware of where they are with their status. Now, the trainers have been great about uh, reaching out and getting in contact with them. But maybe as a collaborative, we'll probably have to uh, make sure that we're following up with that 34% a little more closely, because they're, they they are they're they're you know they're they're not at this point I don't have any document from them and maybe a minimal communication. So that's kind of a general update of where we're at. Any questions about this portion? Because this is probably going to uh, uh, bring up some questions. Okay, can we go to the next slide? So at the moment, we're doing bi-weekly uh, DUA status reports. These are sent to the trainers, and they're also shared with the EIC and the NEDARC staff uh, working on this project. Um, we try to send these out every two weeks, and the next report would be on October 9th. These uh, really give us an over, like a one-liner of where each hospital is at. Um, also ask the training site to uh, maybe follow up if needed or ask them just to hold off if we're, if we're in a negotiation phase. Um, we're, if you have any questions about the, the detail of like one particular site, you can always reach out to me. Um, some of this uh, negotiation phase is a little more nuanced and there's a lot going on, so sometimes it's easier to explain it over the phone or just via email. So yeah, those are my updates. Okay, Mike, what I'm going to do is pass you the keyboard and mouse. Um, there may be instances where there's a lag um, because I'm unmuting all the callers. Um, so give me one second. Go ahead and try to advance the screen for me. All right, I've got a little box here that says take control. Should I just click that, I guess? Yes. Okay, how oh, nice. I see my mouse moving. Is that... Yes, it works. That worked? Okay. Okay, let me just see here. Um, okay. All right, terrific. So I've got uh, control, so that's great. Thanks, Crystal, and thanks, Eddie, for the update on the uh, data use agreements. So good morning, everybody, and it's uh, nice, to, nice to be on the call, and I, I know I can't see or hear any of you, but, but thanks for being on, and it's um it, this has been a fun project to be a part of so i'm gonna for the next oh 20 or 30 minutes just go through the 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 prqc data system and where we're at uh kind of what we've what we've what we're building talk a little bit about a few things um and then i'm going to show you some screenshots of our of our system so far so you can see basically how the flow works and you'll see uh, you know, you'll, you'll have an idea of, of how, what the data capture system looks like. And then we'll talk a little bit about some of the, you know, net remaining steps and um, some of the things we still need to do to, to make this um, so it's ready for use. Um, anyway, so basically uh, our, our job here at NEDARC is to, is to build the database. Um, as part of that, we're going to be building a, a sort of a, a training manual or a help link that will be directly off the database if you have questions on things. Obviously, the data use agreements, which Eddie has just gone through, so I won't uh, spend much more time on that other than to say that, you know, we can't, we can't actually collect data from anybody until we have a fully executed data use agreement here at the University of Utah. And we understand that takes some time. Um, our IT manager has said that's very standard that it takes time. A uh, number of other projects, uh, it, it, it just there's a number of steps to go through. Uh, we'll talk just a little for a second about directory accounts, which is the process of actually 
getting you all set up so you have access to the system and then and then uh, reporting in dashboards. Um, so, see if this advances. Okay, so building the database. This is um, this is by far the, <laughs> the biggest aspect of this uh, of this project. I mean, of our portion of this project. Uh, and we've been we've basically building this. Uh, uh, we're programming it from the ground up. So um, we talked a little bit initially about uh, the best way to, to to build this data capture system. And we thought because it's very it's pretty nuanced and has a lot of uh, different parts to it that we should just program this from the ground up. So um, we're doing that with uh, with our our lead programmer John Brummett. Um, it contains basically uh, a place where you go for the interval site level. Uh, information and then patient level information. Um, and again, I'll show you some screenshots here shortly. This is a this is a manual data entry system, so that uh, the hospital when you're when you're actually getting records from your end that qualify for the bundle that you're working on, you would actually take the information from those records and then basically basically put them into our system um, through through the web. Um, and, and what I'm going to show you right now today is is basically for bundles one through three. Uh, those three bundles, um, um, weight in kilos, um, abnormal vital signs, and transfer guidelines all involve uh, the actual capture and, and, and input of patient level data. Um, and, and there's there's similarities between those three. Uh, bundle four on disaster preparedness is actually sort of a different animal because it's it's not capturing patient level data. Uh, it's it's more policies on on uh, you know disaster preparedness at a specific hospital and um, uh, information on on exercise or simulation uh, drills. So that the bundle the data capture system for bundle four disaster preparedness is actually going to be programmed in a separate system, but we're working on that simultaneously so that, that uh, folks will have access to that as well. Um, so let me advance myself to the next slide here, if it will work. Okay, so Active Directory Accounts. This is just simply basically a, a link that allows uh, the users at, at each hospital to actually um, um, Access our system and, and actually get into our system. Um, the EIC is actually uh, conducting a survey to find out, you know, who the who the individuals at each hospital will be who will be um, need access for data entry and review. We'll have up to two individuals per site. <clears throat> what we'll need is based just simply three pieces of information: the name of the individual or individuals, the institution you represent, and then your email. Uh, then we, we actually create uh, what's called an Active Directory account here at the University of Utah for you. And then we'll send you an email, which will basically say you now have access to the system. Go in with using, it'll just be a temporary password, and then you can reset your password to whatever you want, and then, and then you'll, have, um, you'll have access to our system. So that's just a step we have to go through once we're ready to actually start uh, data collection. Um, so please, if you haven't already, is if the EIC has, has sent out that information, if you, you can identify up to two people at, at your site who will have access to the system. Again, that's for either data entry or, or re being able to review the dashboards. Um, so there's there's nothing really to show yet on the dashboards because we don't have the, the you know the system's not operational yet. We don't have data in it. But um, ultimately, we will you will be able to 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 going into your active active directory account be able to uh, find um, uh, access our dashboard so that you can basically see in aggregate the information that you put into the system and and and, and monitor your um, your performance. So we'll have we'll basically have differing levels of access to the dashboards. Each affiliate site will have access to their information in aggregate. Training sites will have access in aggregate to the entire to their entire um, uh, the, the facilities, the hospitals within their within their team, but but in aggregate, so they're not seeing individual hospital information. And then the EIC will have um, access to all of the all of the um, sites. 
So we use a, a, a program or a software called Tableau, which is really wonderful, really wonderful data visualization software. So um, I think you'll be um, you'll enjoy being able to see your information through the dashboards. All right, so let me now jump into the actual data system and what we've built so far. So you have an idea, and so you can see, uh, and you'll see a number of screenshots. These are all screenshots, and this is not, this is not I'm not live hooked to our database right now. These are just screenshots. So this is a, the, the, the entry screen that you'll see, and you can see it has the PRQC logo, and has a username and a password and a login. Again, the username and the password uh, will be, you know, you'll set your password once once we send you the email, and you'll reset it, and that will be your way to log into the system. So this is the um, initial landing page. Once you get into the system, uh, you'll see the, the logo at the top on the left is PRQC. Um, it will also show what hospital you are affiliated with. Now, if you're just, if you as a user just have a, are just representing one hospital, you will see the name of your hospital right here in this box, and you won't be able to enter information for any other hospital because it's, you know, you're just, you're just tied to that facility. If by chance you're part of a network and you have access, you are the data enterer for multiple hospitals within your network, um, you would have to indicate that to us in the, um, in the survey that's gone out. But then you would see a drop down of all the hospitals that you have access to and then you would actually select which one you're going to be entering data for. So that will be important if you have access to more than one hospital to make sure that you've selected the right hospital. Um, you'll see here across the top there's four, right now there's four um, little boxes that talk about each of the bundles. Uh, bundle four will actually not be part of this because that, that again will be in a different system. But bundle one is um, our uh, weight in kilos, bundle two is abnormal vitals, and bundle three is um, transfer guidelines. Um, these little dashboards just basically show how many patient records are in there, and right now there's nothing. There's not, I've just took a, taken a, a, a blank screenshot so you can see how it looks. Uh, there's a workbench ID or a, a workbench, which I'll talk about in just a second. Then at the bottom here, there's two places where you can go. One is for site information, and one is to actually uh, select, um, to actually create records for patients. The first thing you're going to want to do is actually go to this edit site information because you have to plug in some initial uh, information to um, before you can get started. So if I click on that edit site information button, then you go to a, a site screen which basically says choose a bundle for editing. What's going to be required is that you put in baseline data first for a bundle before you can actually then start putting in information about a PDSA cycle, um, uh, key drivers, uh, education strategies, and that sort of a thing, because we need to have a baseline of data uh, before, we, before we jump into the, the PDSA cycles. So you'll have to select a bundle to start with to enter baseline data, and you, you'll do that, and then some other questions will pop up about what's your, what's your start date for your baseline data. You'll put that in, and then you'll basically be able to uh, then start um, entering data, entering baseline data for the bundle that you have selected. So you come back to this screen then, and then let's say we selected that for bundle one for weight in kilos. Now it would say bundle active rather than bundle not active. And then you would go down and select your intervention bundle to actually start entering baseline data, which in this case would be weight in kilos. And you'd select that and, and click on create a record. Um, you'll see up here some other things. We have this what's called PRQC. This is going to be a, a spot where you can go and and click. And if you have questions or or, or, or are confused by something, it'll be information about how the system works. Um, there'll be a our plan is to have a, a basically a sort of a paper version of the of the of the data entry uh, screenshots and fields, so you can actually print something out and. Um, and capture information on paper if you prefer to do that. But it'll be kind of like a training manual, training manual or, a, or a help, a sort of a help site that you can go to. So let's jump to the next screen. Supposing that we had, uh, uh, we were going to start entering information for our weight in kilos bundle. This is the screen that would pop up once you hit create a record. 
the first thing you'll see is that it says system record number, which is a, a long number here, which is an auto-generated ID number uh, by the system. Uh, we're going to encourage you to actually to keep a record of each of these numbers so that you know what what which which patients you've um, you know how how that this number here ties to the patient on your end because we have obviously can't display any sort of you know patient identification information right here. Um, then that way you'll know which which records you've already entered information for uh, from your end. Um, there's this initial screen asks for some arrival information, the mode of arrival, the date of arrival, time, date of birth of the patient, triage level. We're building in um, logic into these so that you can't, for instance, have uh, somebody's date of birth, which is after the date of, a, uh, of arrival, because that obviously wouldn't make sense and would be an error. So if that was the case, you'd get an error message that would pop up. Um, so that's that's the sort of the top screen. The next screen for weight in kilos uh, shows uh, the weight in medical record. Is it recorded, yes or no? If you hit yes, then these subsequent questions pop up. They're not initially there. It'll ask for the weight measurement unit, whether it's in pounds or kilos or both. I've selected both here, which then, then pops up subsequent questions about what, okay, then what is the actual weight in kilos and what's the weight in pounds in the medical record? You can see here in the in the box, there's a range that have been, has been put in. It shouldn't be over, for instance, 200 kilograms or 400 pounds. If you put in a number higher than one of those, again, it would pop up an error message when you try to submit the record. So we're building in logic checks to try to keep the data as clean as possible, just in case of, a, of an error that gets unintentionally input. Um, if you do select uh, where any admin, uh, medications administered, um, then a whole box of medications pops up here, and then you would select which one uh, was administered, and then uh, how much of the medication was administered and what the route was. Again, this, this information won't normally pop up. It'll only pop up if you hit a, a medication was administered. Uh, then uh, basically you get to the bottom and you will uh, see this, this top box here, which is say save the record or go to workbench. Be very important that you save the record because the data is not automatically being saved as, as you're inputting it. So you very, very, uh, very much you're going to want to make sure you save the record. You'll always be able to come back to it, but if you don't save it, it won't be there once you exit the system. Once you save it uh, and then come back to it, then you'll have an options of, of actually completing the record, um, or if for some reason there's an error and you want to remove it entirely, you can do that as well. Once you hit the complete selected record button, that's when you will get, if there are any error messages, if there's anything that's not consistent in the data system, you will then get a, a message. It will show you, um, you know, that there's an error. Um, let's see, so let me jump to the next screen. Okay, so here's abnormal vital signs. This is the second bundle. Many, some of the screens are gonna look the same, um, but here's um, um, a screenshot of, of data elements that are actually common to both bundle two and three. We, we recognize that it's likely that if you're working on multiple bundles that a patient may actually qualify for both bundles. And so we didn't want you to have to enter information twice that's common to both bundles. And so if you enter it once, basically, um, and you, you, you know, you've selected the two bundles that a patient pertains to, that then the you'd only have to enter the information once, such as weight or triage time or that sort of thing, ICD-10 uh, code. Um, then, then this is abnormal vital signs and it gives a list of all the, all the vitals and whether or not they were taken and they're in the medical record, yes or no. Then there's some subsequent questions about, uh, did the vital signs meet uh, the threshold for abnormal, yes or no? And if so, then some further questions will pop up. Um, this is the uh, bundle on transfer guidelines, just to show you a couple of pieces of information here. First, there's referral site information. So from your side, from the hospital that's referring the patient to another site, um, there's information, or there's questions about whether or not the, the patient met the criteria for a transfer. Um, if the patient was transferred, if so, then some other boxes pop up about the reason for the transfer, you know, check all that apply. Um, and then some, some subsequent questions about the time of the transfer and um, so forth. Uh, and if there was any delay in transfer 
and whether or not there was a telehealth uh, consultation and the reason for, for such. The Four West Medical Surgical Unit Supervisor at Franklin Hospital, part of Ascension. Please leave a message you with your name and number, and I will get back to you as soon as I can. Thank you, and have a good day. Mike, let go. Yeah. Okay, Mike, I need you to let go of the mouse for a second. Give me one second. Okay. Okay, go ahead. Okay, thanks. Um, so that, that, th those are examples of, of screenshots for each of the, the three bundles. All right, do I have control here? Okay, let me just. Okay, and then there's, uh, uh, for transfer guidelines, there's information on the receiving site. Now, um, there'll be actually, a f for patients that are transferred out, there'll be a form that's sent to the receiving hospital that you'll be uh, asking for information on for the patient. Once you get that form back, then you can enter in the information from the receiving site about the patient and uh, their ICD-10 code and their, their um their diagnosis and their disposition and, and so forth. Uh, this is one of the reasons the transfer guideline bundle is a good example of a, of, a, of a bundle where you can probably enter some initial information on your side, but you may be waiting for subsequent information from the receiving hospital. So you'll want to you know, save the record and then come back in at a later time to input the, the information once you get it from the receiving hospital. Um, so again, so error messages. Um, you can save a record without any problem. You can save a record with wrong information. You can save a record with no information in there, uh, just because we know that you'll you might you might have incomplete information initially uh, before you can actually close out a record. When you go to actually close out the record is when you would get an error message, if there is an error, any sort of error. And it will what it'll do is it'll show you two things. It'll show you First thing up in this upper right-hand corner will actually tell you, could not close out the bundle, uh, please check all required fields, and then it says first error, bundle one has medication rule errors. In this case, um, we selected medications that were given to the patient, but, uh, and then those, those medications popped up below it and asked for how much was given in a route, but nothing was put in to, that, to those boxes. So it's saying, basically saying these boxes need to be need to be completed before the record can be saved. If they had been completed and, for instance, it was an out of range, in other words, if, if more than a, you know, if this was more than a thousand uh, milliliters of normal saline bolus, it would, it would say, that it would still say a medication rule error and you'd have to see, oh, um, it's over a thousand, so there's a, there's a problem there. So we're building in those sorts of checks into the system so, it, again, we can make sure the data is, is, is clean and, um, uh, you know, as a quality control uh, mechanism. Um, then this 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 shows your uh, uh, what I what I came in on the very first page the workbench. This shows a screenshot of a workbench where you where you might have input and saved a number of records and are working on them, but they haven't been closed out yet. So you can see here uh, this 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 number this long number here is the number that's generated for each each record. It, it shows whether or not what bundle it pertains to, uh, and if it's, you know, for instance, this bundle or this record here pertains to a patient that is, that is both for bundle one and for bundle two. Uh, this record is for only bundle two. Again, you may only be working on one bundle at a time, which is completely fine. Then it would, you'd only have like one active bundle going here, and all your records would pertain to just one bundle. But this is, is a workbench to show you what basically what records are still in process or haven't been completed. Once you complete them and submit them, then they disappear from here, and, and then they, they, you won't see them anymore. That's one of the reasons why we're encouraging you to write down that patient ID number so you know on your end if, you know, what, what records have been submitted, because um, they, they'll disappear from your view here. So um, that's, that's a basic kind of a stroll through the data capture system as it's built right now. Um, you know, this is this is obviously a really exciting uh, project, the whole PRQC project. Uh, we're glad that so many hospitals are interested in working on this. It's our, our you know, a, a, a really an opportunity to get to patient level, uh, to input patient level data, and really look at look at um, 
you know, implementing QI practices in a in a facility and, and, and with the ultimate goal, of course, of improving care for children. Um, there are a, but a number of challenges with this, um, with the database and, and building the data capture system as, as well as, you know, the entire project. It's a, it's a big project. It's very complex. It's got a complex structure with trying to, um, you know, integrate patient data with uh, QI practices and have patients cross multiple bundles. So it's taken quite a bit of time to build, uh, to test, and to refine, which we're still in the process of doing. Um, unfortunately, we have um, we have our lead programmer, John Brummett, who's been working on this, but uh, there was another programmer who was going to be assigned to help. Uh, we lost that programmer, in addition lost one of the other programmers in our shop. So John's been sort of buried with this project as well as others, as well as trying to hire new programmers. So that that's caused a delay in in, in just simply the, the ability to move forward as quickly as we thought, as we had hoped. Um, so some of the remaining steps in an anticipated timeline are, um, again, we're still in the process of testing, uh, building and testing internally. Um, and it, and it's, it's hard to, it, it's hard to know exactly how this will, will, uh, will all go, but, but basically we're doing some clinical review of the system now that it's captured in the, in the database and going through and looking at the questions and making sure that they all look right. Once you take them from a data dictionary and put them into an actual system, sometimes things don't look quite right. The response choices aren't complete. The flow of the questions may, not, may need a little altering. There may be possibly some redundant questions, and so we need to do that, uh, continue to modify and uh, make modifications based on that. At the same time, we're, we're actually still in, uh, internally testing for other kinds of bugs, um, you know, just to make sure like records save properly and the, the skip logic is working. Um, once we once we do that, we're going to be testing with uh, with 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 Kate and the EIC group because right now it's just internal to, to the University of Utah. We have to make an access path for Kate uh, and her group to be able to start testing it as well. Uh, there'll be some modifications from that. Um, Probably from that, uh, then then at that point we're gonna we want to start field testing with a handful, maybe two or three hospitals that are that that are willing to be our field test because we really want people to, you know, to 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 go into the system and to to experiment and to make sure things work, to give us feedback on questions they might have because we we really need that sort of open objective field test to to make sure that the system is working the way it should. We've seen it so many times now that we're kind of, it's hard for us to tell, um, you know, how it's going to look for a brand new user. There'll inevitably be some modifications from that um, before we can actually go fully live with, 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 with more hospitals who have executed the DUA. So, um, and then in addition, we'll be working on the training manual and, and the dashboard. We can't test the dashboard yet until we have more information into the system, more records, even if they're, if they're fake records. So it's a little bit hard to tell exactly what the timing on this. Uh, some of this stuff hopefully can go sooner um, and can be done um, could be done more quickly if we, you know, depending on what kinds of errors or things we find. It is possible though that we're still, uh, uh, you know, a couple of months out from being able to to actually implement this and to get it more widespread, broad to um, uh, to all users. But um, the good news is we have a system. It's it's. It's, it's working, we need to test it and refine it and test it more because we really want it to be a stable, reliable platform for, um, for consistent data entry for all of the hospitals. Uh, we don't want to push it out before it's ready and then have things break and then, and then there's delays and there's frustration on, on everybody's end. Um, and then we'll be working on bundle four simultaneous with all this, through all this uh, and, and building the data capture system for that piece. So that was a mouthful and um, Hopefully that was helpful though to see some of the screenshots and to know a little bit more about the data capture system. I'd be happy to answer any questions if there are any. Hi Mike, so we did get a question. Um, one of those in particular is can we generate a report for data that we enter into the system? Can we generate a report for data that, enter, that we can enter in the system? I'm not exactly sure what the, what, what what that question means, but if if you're 
So could you speak to the data that's entered? Can they generate a printout oh, of the date, the actual data that was entered that they may be able oh. to put in a binder or uh, charts? Oh, okay. Um, at this point, the, the reporting feature will be for the in, in the through the dashboards, and I think it's it's largely going to focus on some of the the, the QI uh, practices and and PDSA cycles and what 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 you're seeing um, through the PDSA cycle. So at this point, we don't have a mechanism to, for instance, generate a report with all the variables that were entered in for a specific patient um, or even an aggregate report. If that's something that's uh, important to people, we could we can certainly talk about what it would take to do that. Though um, I think I think at this point that was not that that's not that was not a um, something we had planned on doing, but but uh, but we can we can discuss it more in, in detail if it's if it's a top priority. And so um, I also want to add to uh, Mike's presentation that we are going to be releasing a data guide soon. Uh, the data guide will walk you through each individual variable for each bundle. Um, it will specify which variables are optional versus required. Um, it will give you some of those drop-down uh, options that you will have available um, in the portal or the data entry system, and then we'll also include notes that you should consider with respect to particular variables. So that will definitely be something that sites can um, uh, rely on as they're doing their data entry. So that's going to be something coming down the pipeline soon. Uh, we have a couple. Let's see. Oh, go ahead. Oh, just and just to add to that, Crystal. Again, I don't. I should have said this in the first. I didn't I hope people feel like they had to scribble down notes while I was talking here because again, we'll have a as part of the system. There'll be like a, a, a sort of a, a a link to go to off the system if you have questions. Um, um, you know, sort of a training manual, uh, and, and um, if hopefully we're going to build a, a sort of a training video as well that would actually sort of instruct somebody how to go through the system. All those things, of course, take time, but but that's our our, our plan. Any other questions for Mike? We encourage you to uh, use the chat uh, feature and um, send that message to uh, the entire group. Okay, so we just actually received a series of questions, and Kate, they actually apply to your next section, which is specifically about data collection. So, um, Kate, what I'm going to do is give you keyboard and mouse control. If at any point we hear interference, I'll take that control from you to remute all of the callers, um, and then I'll grant you access to uh, continue with the presentation. Okay, Kate. Let's see. To Mike for um, all the work that uh, he uh, and his team have done. Um, Chris, I'm having difficulty moving the slides. Go on. Uh, right. Give me one second. Okay. Go ahead and press enter on your keyboard. There you go. Okay. Perfect. Um, so I just want to say a brief, you know, thanks to Mike and his team for pulling this all together. Um, it uh, has been a tremendous amount of work, and especially with the loss of uh, two programmers, um, this has been, uh, you know, a, a really big project. And what you heard from him is that our ultimate goal is to make sure that we have an excellent product for you all to use and that there aren't failures or that there aren't areas of confusion and that we get you the information that you need so you can be most effective. Um, as Mike said, we are in the process of doing internal testing and soon that's going to us at the EIC so that we can um, be testing the system as well. Um, because of, you know, there have been a series of delays, I think, with this project. One is um, certainly related to the data entry system, but the DUAs have obviously taken longer than we also anticipated, as you heard from Eddie. Um, we know that there are some, you know, 30 sites that have fully executed um, DUAs, which is fantastic, but a large number who still do not. Um, and so, you know, part of, uh, you know, working through quality improvement and collaboratives is that these are iterative changes. 
Um, and sometimes we just have to slow down and make sure we get it right uh, rather than pushing through that with something that's less than perfect. So our goal here, again, is just to make this the best product that we can um, uh, to help support you all. We realize that um, this you know, delay means that rather than starting data collection today, um, we're looking at closer to the beginning of the new year for starting data collection, which means that based on the timeline uh, that we set forth for this collaborative, gives us essentially 12 months to run through PDSA cycles. We do feel that during this time that will be sufficient to be able to um, get everyone going and moving forward uh, and improving their readiness. Um, what we will have to do during the course of this collaborative is reassess, um, just like we do in quality improvement, is we, we plan, we do, we study how the collaborative is going, and then we'll have to take a, a step back and reassess um, as to whether this timeline is working well for everyone and if we're able to accomplish the goals that we set forth um, when we started this collaborative. So our hope is that we'll still be able to uh, keep you guys on track um, to get to where we want to be by the end of uh, December 2019. Um, but we ask that you be you know, flexible with us uh, while we try to generate um, this data entry system and user guides to um, be as useful as possible for all of you. So if you have any questions that come up about that, um, please don't hesitate to you know, reach us or send us an email. Um, and, you know, of course, uh, we're doing our best uh, to make this most effective for you all. So um, we did want to start talking a little bit about data collection. And for those of you who have completed your uh, data use agreements, uh, you should now have access to um, the IHI modules, online modules, which will help to solidify a lot of this um, quality improvement science that we continue to talk about. We talk about plan do study act cycles, we talk about the difference between improvement science and research, um, and data collection and data sampling are certainly key to that. So as you finish your DUAs, you will have access to those IHI modules and feel um, a little bit more um, skilled to be able to address some of these changes that we're planning to um, implement. Um, the other piece is that we've also um, put together environmental scans that allow you to look at the gaps that currently exist um, within your system, and linked to those environmental scans uh, is the question that uh, Mike had mentioned, which is who are actually going to serve as um, the data stewards for uh, your site. Um, and so these are kind of the, the roles of the data steward. Um, so this is someone who's going to have login to the data entry system that Mike just mentioned, and we can allow for up to two individuals per site. Um, to be able to have login access. Um, and this is someone who will really need to familiarize themselves with the data user's guide. So this is the wiki site link that Mike demonstrated earlier. It was that green link up at the top of the data entry system. And then also the data user's guide um, that's going to supplement that that Crystal mentioned so that you can really understand what is being asked with these variables and make sure that there's no confusion. These will also be individuals who will be um, pulling charts and reviewing those charts um, based on the data sampling strategy that you develop for your individual site. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, it's really important that these data stewards know where the variables exist on the medical record and how to locate them. I know there was a question about, um, for example, ICD-10 codes. Um, if there's a particular patient and you're looking for a diagnosis, some of these variables are optional, and the ICD-10 code is one of those. So if they're variables that don't exist in the medical record, um, not all of these are required. So uh, we're just trying to provide you with as much useful information on the dashboard side as possible um, so that you can get um, pull a story together um, that you'll be able to tell for your site and to your ED and hospital leadership. Um, but not all variables are required, and so knowing where those variables exist on the medical record, knowing which are required is going to be really important for that data steward. Um, this person may also be working with the champion, of course, or you may be the champion um, and will be trying to help implement additional you know, change strategies, whether that be um, pulling in family evaluation forms for interfacility transfers or trying to get feedback from the receiving um, centers when patients are transferred out. Um, those sort of things, 
Um, again, this may be the champion who also serves as the data, the data stored, and that is perfectly acceptable. Um, we just know at some of the larger sites, um, there may be another person that um, is needed to help support this project, and that is perfectly fine as well. Um, the other key piece that uh, Mike mentioned is the importance of maintaining a patient log. Um, so with the data entry system, we tried to minimize um, private healthcare information that would be shared um, to the greatest extent we possibly could. Really, we're trying to look at performance, um, of course, related to patients, so there are certain elements that we just couldn't avoid, um, like understanding the age of patients, so dates of birth, and the date of arrival. But we are not asking for things like patient names and medical record numbers and the like. Um, and so because of that, uh, when a patient is entered into the system, there's a system identifier that's generated. And the only way you will be able to go back and modify a patient record is if you know who that identifier links to in your system. So this is something that would be maintained locally, um, but it was, would essentially be a patient log that, that is a crosswalk between the system, the data entry system identifiers, and your hospital or emergency department's um, specific medical records um, or identifiers that you have there. Um, so those are uh, the issues related to the data stewards. Um, I did see that a question came up regarding whether or not um, that data collection could be started at this point um, and, and how to begin thinking about doing that. So what we would recommend, and we'll talk more about this in the next few minutes, is that you begin developing a strategy for data sampling. It is possible that you will be able to enter data, you know, from the fall as your baseline data um, and just enter it in, for example, December, um, so that you can pull some data retroactively. Um, but it's difficult to determine what change strategies you're going to implement until you know the results of that baseline data. Um, so we are advising that any change strategies wait until you have your baseline data collection um, uh, entered. Um, See if I can move to the next slide. There we go. Um, so um, as we move into the data collection process, uh, it is important to just remember that what we're talking about here is quality improvement. This is not research. So rather than really, you know, proving effectiveness across large populations or a large variety of situations, what we're simply looking for is sustained improvement at the local level. And so rather than gathering large amounts of data, what we're hoping to do is just gather enough data to be able to inform our improvement process or our own um, patient care that's being delivered at our, at our site. And so the tests are generally uh, rapid. Um, we usually will do them in sequence, so one after another. Um, and we're really not trying to control for things like bias necessarily. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, these pieces later, but we're really just trying to look at trends. Um, in addition, uh, rather than using things like t-tests and regression analysis to, to look at significance of the data, again, we're trending. And so what we'll be looking at really are, is something called run charts. And again, we'll talk a little bit more about that um, in the upcoming learning sessions when we talk about data display. Um, but suffice it to say that we're not doing research here, we're doing quality improvement work. So most PDSA cycles for the, for the sites that are participating will take um, probably one month or more, and it really depends on the volume of pedi pediatric patients that you see in your ED. Uh, again, pediatric patients are going to be defined by your site, so we have not set a cutoff for that. That's for you to determine uh, at the local level. We are aiming for a, approximately 30 char charts minimum per uh, PDSA cycle, plan, do, study, act cycle, and again, just so that we can assess for those trends. And as we mentioned, we want to gather that baseline data before we begin those PDSA cycles. And that's really critical because it helps us to be able to tell our story um, as we move forward. The graphic that you see here just really demonstrates what that PDSA cycle is. So um, we're going to plan first. So we're going to develop a smart aim, see what goal we want to try to achieve. And then we're going to consider you know, potential change strategies and go ahead and work towards implementing those strategies which may take a certain period of time, and then we'll get into the data collection and entry. Um, and that, once we've finished entering that data, that technically will end the PDSA cycle. And that's important for you all to understand where the PDSA cycles begin and end uh, so that you know how to enter those dates 
um, into the data entry system. So we talked about baseline data before, and again, this is really important because it allows you to tell your story and it allows you to be successful and continue to have ongoing local support um, because you're able to tell the story of improvement. Um, and so the reason for the baseline data is that we have to get that current performance before we start implementing intervention bundles so we can see how much indeed we have improved. We talk about the importance of measurement and quality improvement, and that measurement is important because it, it allows us to determine the level of impact of our efforts and or change strategies. And so we're asking that everybody complete this prior to um, obtaining buy-in on particular change strategies or prior to educating staff on um, the specifics of um, you know, your smart aim or the projects, uh, the specifics of the bundle you're working on. And that's in order to avoid any kind of Hawthorne effect so that you can really see um, the impact uh, of the work that you're doing over the course of this collaborative. Um, the other piece is really related to data sampling. So the purpose of sampling is so that we can try to learn as efficiently as possible um, how our change strategies are actually performing on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we typically will talk about three different um, methods for sampling. Uh, Typically, we start with simple or, or random sampling where we're selecting data from you know, our sample pediatric population using a random process. And this could be something like pulling every third chart or every fifth chart, um, depending on the volume of patients that uh, you see at your institution. Other types of sampling talk about you know, using stratified um, sampling as opposed to simple random sampling. And so, the idea behind this is that you're dividing your pediatric population into separate categories. Um, we may be doing this a little bit with bundles two and three because we're looking at either those children that have abnormal vital signs or those children who are transferred as opposed to all pediatric patients. Um, but typically this is, for example, um, you know, looking at a certain age group. Um, so maybe it would be just looking at infants or just looking at adolescent patients. What we really want to do with this project is try to focus just on simple random sampling to start with where we're gathering information on all of the pediatric patients because our goal in this collaborative is, in, is to improve pediatric emergency care overall. Future projects that, you, that this might lead into um, could you know, potentially uh, focus on stratified sampling, but we're asking folks to stay away from that at this point. The frequency of data collection is important because the more frequently that we sample, then potentially the faster that we can see improvement or trends. Um, so sometimes this is done on a daily basis or a weekly basis. We would advise that folks choose at least at a minimum a weekly basis so that you can uh, see uh, changes over time. Um, but certainly you could uh, choose to do more, more frequent sampling than that. Um, some sites may choose to do an automated sampling process as opposed to a manual, but either one is fine and it really just depends on the resources that are available at your site. And again, the length of your PDSA cycle is going to depend on the number of encounters that you anticipate um, who would fall into um, your sampling process. So um, we are, of course, aiming for um, approximately 30 charts per cycle. Um, and the reason we're choosing, you know, this small number is, again, we're looking at trending, but typically with, you know, PDSA cycles, we'll start small and we'll do small tests of change and then, you know, we'll scale up uh, as needed. And really the scale of um, a PDSA cycle depends in part on the degree of belief that you, that you um, have that the change will lead to improvement and also how much the staff um, that you're working with will actually buy into the change strategies that um, you're going to be implementing. And then the last piece, of course, is the potential consequences if um, consequences or costs if a change doesn't lead to improvement. But aiming for 30 charts um, typically falls within um, the category that we anticipate um, all of these intervention strategies would, would follow. And we've talked a little bit about that before, and I'll talk about it in just a few minutes again. Um, but again, within the um, scope of this collaborative, we're looking specifically at pediatric patients as defined by your institution. When it comes to bundle one, really all pediatric patients can be included here. 
Um, and then uh, for bundles two, three, and four, we might think about um, really trying to target certain types of patients. It doesn't make sense to look at interfacility transfers in patients that aren't transferred. So, of course, bundle three, we're really focused on those transferred patients. Bundle two, because we're looking at abnormal vital signs, we're looking at those patients who potentially have higher triage levels, like triage levels one through three, uh, rather than those that might be triaged at levels four through five. And then, of course, for bundle four, um, this is focused on disaster drills as opposed to, um, you know, other uh, patient charts or actual records. So um, when it comes to um, privacy uh, and patient logs, so we talked about data use agreements. I've mentioned this a little bit, that we're using limited data sets. We do ask about date of birth and date of arrival, but we're not asking for patient names or medical records or full PHI data that is being shared. And this is why the patient logs are important. Um, so this is just a sample recommendation of what that patient log might look like. So you might have a list of the PDSA cycle that you're on, um, the patient number, this could be one through 30 or more, if you choose to enter more, um, the medical record at your particular site, and then the data entry system identifier that's generated for each record. And again, this needs to be maintained by um, the champion or the data stored at your site. Um, this is not maintained externally at all. Um, and if this is lost, then we don't have a cross link between um, the patient medical record or the data entry system which may make it hard to go back and either correct records um, or review them. Um, this is where I mentioned about scope and scale of PDSA cycles. We talked about this a little bit before, um, but in general, um, we have a fairly high confidence that the changes we implement are going to be leading to um, improvements. Um, and we hope that those improvements will be at least small, but hopefully closer to the moderate to large improvement range based on knowledge that in many of these um, interventions, we're not already doing these processes to the extent that we'd like to be. And so this just kind of gives you an overview of how high our confidence is that the change will lead to improvement, um, what our risk of failure is. Um, in these cases, uh, that risk is small. Um, we're not talking about costly interventions. Um, and then when, it when we're talking about staff buy-in, um, you know, hopefully uh, the great majority will either be indifferent or ready. And this, of course, depends on your ability to speak to um, this project and uh, the work that you're doing. And so you'll see that for moderate to large improvements, we typically will think about 15 to 20 charts minimum. For small improvements, 50 to 100. We know that these are smaller volume sites. We're hoping to start with about 30 charts per PDSA cycle um, so that we can actually look at those trends uh, without burdening folks um, of, you know, significant amounts of data entry. Um, core to PDSA and quality improvement work, of course, is iterative testing. Um, if we don't have a lot of buy-in, we start really small, um, maybe just with one encounter, one patient, one provider. Um, but we want to be able to grow up fast. And if we see something that we think is working, um, then the typical uh, recommendation is to scale it up with the five times rule. So one, and then five, and then 25, and then 125, and so on and so forth. So we're really trying to increase the spread as quickly as we can as we move through um, these various PDSA cycles. Um, you may also think about doing concurrent testing. So some of you may choose to work on multiple different interventions at the same time or implement um, concurrent tests at the same time, and we can certainly um, support that and encourage that, and we'll talk a little bit more about how that might work at your site as we move forward. Um, so the, the last couple pieces will be how do we know if change equals improvement? And as I mentioned before, we're, we're looking at trends. We're not looking at um, research to measure significant through regression models and the like. And so this is a dynamic um, uh, model as opposed to something that's more static. And we're looking at trends over time. And what you'll see here in the bottom right corner is just a sample of a run chart um, that we'll be using to generate for each of you um, through those dashboards. Um, and this is something that um, Patty Schmuel from NEDARC um, is working on to be able to make sure that everyone can actually begin to look at those trends, 
and be able to share that story with their ED and hospital leadership. And like I said, there'll be more to come on data interpretation in the upcoming learning sessions. Um, and then the last part is that, you know, sometimes even though we implement change strategies that we really think will work, sometimes they don't lead to improvement. Um, and so um, in the upcoming learning sessions, we'll be talking about why that might happen, um, whether it's due to poor execution of our change strategy or data collection, or whether it really is a true fail, um, and then how we troubleshoot around that. Um, but more to come uh, in future learning sessions. Okay, Kate, you have a couple of questions before we switch to housekeeping. Um, a couple of our affiliate sites are asking specifically, when will they collect their baseline data? Or when should they start collecting baseline data? Right, so um, I tried to address that a little bit um, at the beginning, but what we wanna make sure that we do is that we get that baseline data in place before we um, select our next change strategy because we want to make sure we know uh, how our current performance is. Um, so if you're a small volume site, you may choose to um, develop your data sampling strategy now, and you can certainly think about collecting or identifying charts that you would review and enter into the data entry system as soon as the portal goes live. And that is perfectly acceptable to do is to begin looking at um, those patient charts, maybe reviewing the data guide, making sure that the variables that you need, you know where they are, um, so that you can actually begin that collection and be ready to enter them as soon as the data portal is open. Um, but we would prefer that you at least wait uh, to implement any change strategies until you have that baseline data um, entered and in place uh, so you know where you can move forward. One of the next questions is if your group is a network, does each site have the same AIM statement and PDSA process? Um, they do not have to. So our goal is that every single site will have their own SMART AIM because we anticipate that the level of performance is different at each site, even if you're part of the same network. Um, so what we would recommend is that as a network or a team, you might have a, a SMART AIM um, that exists for your entire team or network, but each site really should have their own SMART AIM. Um, and it may take a few cycles to really get to the AIM that's consistent with the network AIM, um, but start with uh, where you are um, and just work on those small steps of improvement. Any other any questions? questions? Okay, I'll turn um, the platform back over to Crystal. Thanks, Kate. Um, so now what we want to do is spend a couple minutes really talking about housekeeping and what to keep on your radar. Um, keep in mind that we are offering maintenance and certification credit for all of our physicians that are boarded um, in emergency medicine, pediatrics, family medicine, or internal medicine. Um, these physicians must be providing direct or consultative care to the target patients in the emergency department. They should be actively involved in the PRQC for eight consecutive months, and we're asking that they attend the designated number of department meetings where data is reviewed and interventions are discussed. Um, it will be up to the pediatric champion to determine what's the adequate number of meetings that those physicians should be involved in to be considered meaningful participation. We are uh, asking that they have some history of completing QI education. In the event that they have not had any formal QI training, the PRQC will um, have some um, avenues to help assist with that um, requirement. So uh, we are asking the pediatric champion help us with enrollment. Um, that we have a um, an announcement or a flyer that you can share with physicians at your local emergency department, really to just announce that this um, initiative is available and it will actually help garner some support from your colleagues. Um, we will ask that you compile a list of physicians that are interested in participating, and then a member of our team 
will reach out to those physicians and get additional information, and that includes their contact info. They'll need to select which boards they're requesting credit for, and then we'll ask for their American Board of Pediatrics ID number or their national provider ID number. Uh, that's a process that you can actually start now. So what you can do is um, email us just one comprehensive list of those physicians that are interested in participating with their email address, uh, and we'll give you uh, we'll go ahead and get that process started for their enrollment. Um, we want you to also keep in mind that you should be inviting those physicians to your local meetings and activities related to the collaborative. Um, and those should be meetings where you're discussing their interventions and data. If you're hosting educational sessions, that's a great opportunity for those physicians to get involved. And keep in mind that we have an implementation toolkit available, and you can find additional information there on pages 29 and 30. Um, so now what I want to do is walk you through your task list, a couple of reminders. If you have not had a site visit with your training site, um, we encourage you to do that as soon as possible. And remember that can be in person or virtual. The site visit one survey is to be completed by all affiliate sites. Uh, and that's something that gives us just an over, overview of your hospital infrastructure. It is separate from the environmental scan. If you have any questions about that, please let us know. The pediatric readiness assessment uh, should have been completed this summer. The portal will be closing soon as they prepare for the next assessment. Um, so we will be sending announcements out to all trainers for those uh, delinquent sites that haven't submitted their peds ready assessment. And as um, Eddie mentioned, we are encouraging you to submit or at least make some contact with NEDARC regarding your data use agreements. For those sites that have established their data use agreement, we've sent emails regarding uh, two pieces of information. We are requesting two QI champions that individual, those individuals will get access for uh, the Institute for Healthcare Improvements uh, QI modules. They'll have full access to the program. Um, and then we're requesting contact information for one to two data stewards. You will be asked to complete that environmental scan for us and then proceed with those steps that we've outlined in that implementation toolkit. And then keep in mind contact information for those physicians that are seeking MOC credit. For those that are awaiting their DUAs, we still encourage you to go ahead and complete that environmental scan. There's nothing that should be able to stop you from doing that. Um, you can review the intervention bundles and the deep dive content that are posted on our PRQ file sharing site. We also encourage you to consider membership on your core and implementation teams, become familiar with the toolkit, and then keep your trainer and need arc apprised of any barriers or concerns you have with your DUA process. And as I mentioned earlier, go ahead and start enrollment for the MOC uh, credit initiative. As a reminder, we are currently using a file sharing site. We call it the PRQC Box site. And there you can find the implementation toolkit. Um, so it's not just available for those DUA um, established sites, but anyone can find it there. Our intervention bundles one through four are there along with the recorded uh, sessions and PDFs and the actual PowerPoint so that you can make uh, revisions and share that as part of your educational sessions. All of the learning sessions are posted. Actually, today's slides are already on the site. We'll post those, uh, the recording of this today's session a little bit later. Um, you will have action items so you know that we are always saying complete a survey and assessment. You can find a copy of all of our commonly used links um, in this folder, the DUA content that Eddie mentioned, and then we have our foundational articles as well as our 2018 and 2019 calendar. Here you'll see the intervention bundles. Um, if you are having any issues with accessing the PRQC box site due to firewalls at your hospital, please um, enter your email address privately in the chat box and we will send you a yellow tail file with all of those documents uh, for you to download. And please specify if there's a particular bundle that you're looking for or if there's a particular learning session that you'd like access to. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we have put together an implementation toolkit. Uh, this comprehensive toolkit will really be um, the resource that your hospital can use to launch the improvement efforts. Um, you'll see a copy of the environmental scan there. You are not to submit these uh, responses via email. It must be submitted through the survey link. Um, but rather than you opening the survey and coming back to it, we have a paper copy just to assist that process with data entry. You have the formal implementation toolkit that's listed here. You have a uh, Word version of the MOC flyer that you can share with your colleagues. 
and also enter additional information. And then we've mentioned this uh, several times, but we, we're really happy to show you all that we have PRQC talking points, which can be adapted by our participating sites. Um, I just want to give you a snapshot of what that looks like. So here's our file sharing site. You'll have some background information here that says that you, we encourage you to customize this deck um, based on your facility's information. It's about 22 slides. It's our typical template. You'll see our acknowledgments, but it gives you some background information about the National Pediatric Readiness Project. It includes information about QI collaboratives. And then you'll see additional information that you can enter here about snapshots of your hospital, like your Peds Ready score, um, the aggregate score um, compared to the national average. Insert some information about why you're addressing these gaps at your facility. And then we leave a couple templates, and then you'll have graphics. So you'll have the PRQC logo available. Uh, you'll have a, some image that describes the team structure and then the role of the pediatric champion and trainer. And so what we're hoping is that as you're establishing these partnerships within your hospital and within your community, you can use um, this slide deck to sort of uh, get the, roll, uh, the ball rolling. You'll also have the sort of comprehensive list of teams here as well as all of the participating hospitals. This may be something that's important to your C-suite. Um, so remember, all of this information is covered in the Implementation Toolkit folder uh, on our box site. As a reminder, uh, the Implementation Toolkit um, is pretty comprehensive. We have common terms, membership. Um, you'll see some of the key features that you should keep in mind as you're launching the PDSA cycles at your hospital. And then we have some examples of QI concepts, of smart aim statements. We have templates for that, templates for your PDSA worksheets, key driver diagrams, an example of a process map, instructions for uh, accessing that QI education module. The one thing you'll notice is that the passcode is not entered there, but that will be released to the sites when they establish their data use agreements, and as well as that information about the maintenance of certification and commonly used websites and links. Our next learning session is scheduled for November 13th, and during that session we will cover, um, we will spotlight three to five PRQC teams. They'll discuss topics such as building synergy amongst their team members, characteristics of their participating hospitals, and best practices. Um, we will have intervention bundle updates in our plans for 2019, and there will be some discussion about data um, as well. So uh, what we'll do now is open the floor for questions. Um, if you have any, please um, include those in the chat box. Kate, I'm going to unmute you, and I know you guys didn't hear from Diana today, but she is on the call, um, so I'll unmute her as well, um, and we can take a couple questions. We still have about 15 or so minutes. Kate? Yeah, I'm on. So if anyone has questions, please feel free to share them in the chat box if you like. Um, thanks for sharing all that information, and again, please enter your email if you are not able to access the box site because there's a lot of really critical information in that box site and um, if you can't, can't get access to that easily and regularly, we need to uh, develop an alternative means for you to do that. Are there any uh, remaining questions around um, the data use agreement or the data entry site or anything that need art covered. So at this time, everyone's unmuted, so feel free to ask any questions. Great. And any questions um, remaining about data sampling or any of the housekeeping items that Crystal and I covered? Okay. Um, we know that this is a lot of information that we've been going over over the last four months. Uh, hopefully you feel, um, you know, well-versed in the work of this collaborative and um, the work that you all will be doing to improve Pete's readiness. Um, we're grateful for your all's ongoing participation. And um, again, please feel free to reach out to us at any time if you have questions. Uh, we are here to support all of you uh, during the course of this. 
Uh, we do have additional office hours coming up on October 16th. Um, so if you don't have them on your calendar, remember that these are openly available for anyone who wants to call in. These are not um, structured teachings or um, reviews. Um, we're simply on the line um, to speak with you if you have any questions or concerns. Um, so please uh, feel free to join us um, if you do so. So thank you all for your time today. We'll give you thank back you. up. Thank you. Great work. Thank you.